There are many constraints on sociological research methods, and they can be broadly divided into three main headings theoretical, practical, and ethical concerns. Although the theoretical issues ought to be the overriding considerations, often it is the practical and ethical considerations which moderate the research. This podcast will consider each issue in turn. Firstly, theoretical considerations. The founding fathers of sociology were clear that the subject was a science, the science of society, the highest and most difficult science of them all. However, as the 20th century progressed, sociologists divided themselves into two main groups. The first group, the positivists, believe society is outside the individual and they seek to measure it. These researchers try to use the methods of science, adapting experimentation from laboratory to society in the form of field experiments and adopting the use of statistics from mathematics. The main methods here are social surveys, large-scale studies which generate numerical data, a measure of society. The statistics generated can be compared to see the influence of, for example, gender on academic achievement. These are called quantitative methods, and they are reliable or replicable. That is, if they were repeated by another researcher, the same result would be found. However, this type of research may not be valid. It may not present a true picture of the situation. Samples may be unrepresentative. People may lie, and researchers may fail to ask important questions. The second group are the interactionists, who believe that we construct society in our minds, and they seek to study how we do it. The sociologists in this case are searching for the way people make sense of their world, and how people interpret particular events and behaviours. In other words, they are looking for meaning. The shallow, large-scale questionnaire or structured interview does not give respondents the opportunity to explain their view of the world in sufficient detail, so unstructured interviews and observations are used. These are qualitative methods, and they are valid. That is, they produce a true picture of the situation. However, they cannot be repeated, so they are not reliable. By the late 20th century, many sociologists were combining methods in a process of triangulation, first described by Eileen Barker. There are many ways that qualitative and quantitative data can be used together. Qualitative data may be used to generate a hypothesis to be tested quantitatively, whilst a case study may be used to illuminate a large-scale survey. At the same time, feminists were claiming that mainstream methods were in fact male-stream and should be abandoned for the study of women because only women can understand the female experience. Feminists aim to generate knowledge that can be used to fight women's disadvantage. Thus, their research targets such areas rather than studying the whole of society. Feminists also believe that respondents should be treated as collaborators equal partners in the research process. Oakley's study of childbirth is an example of this. Meanwhile, postmodernists were denying that there was any such thing as truth or society and were busy deconstructing ideas to understand their relevance and influence. By the start of the 21st century, these ideas were taken up by the left-wing critical social researchers who are deconstructing elements of social life to find their essence and looking for new understandings. However, critical researchers are not seeking to be objective, but to use their findings to fight inequality and oppression. So the current situation is that these theoretical concerns influence the sociologist's choice of particular research methods in very complex ways. Our second issue is practicality. However desirable it is to study society by a chosen method, the practical issues may become overriding and compromises have to be made. Funding is a major issue. Most research is funded by the government and they may be keen to fund research which they see as having practical outcomes, such as a reduction in crime or an improvement in attainment for boys. 
universities also fund research and may have particular specialisms, which constrain researchers. In addition, research on a wide range of social issues is funded by organisations such as the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. Some funding bodies will require data in a particular form. For example, the government may require statistical data on education or qualitative information on drug abuse. Studying illegal behaviour may only be possible by joining a deviant lifestyle, so these studies are usually covert and observational. This may have severe disadvantages, but it is often the only possible way to complete the study. Researchers need particular physical and emotional characteristics to complete this work. Patrick had to be young and male. Roles in the gang appropriate for Patricia would not be appealing to a female researcher. A further example of this is Sharp's study of prostitution, which was made possible because the girls could identify with her, and also because she was able to offer them practical help. The time available to complete the study may be an issue. Where time and funding are short, it may be possible to search already published sources, secondary data, as the basis of study. However, there are considerable disadvantages to this as well. Our third issue is ethical constraints. Advice about all the main ethical dilemmas is contained in the Ethical Code of the British Sociological Association. Punch has summarised the four main areas as harm, consent, deception and privacy and confidentiality. We will consider each in turn. The first issue is harm. Respondents should not suffer harm as a result of taking part in sociological research. Research that feeds a moral panic, for example, about criminal activity in the immigrant population, may harm wider groups in society, not just those who are part of the research. Sociologists may discover the group they are studying is about to harm someone else. In this case, should they merely observe the behaviour or should they inform the police and forfeit the study? Researchers may feel comfortable putting their own lives at risk. Patrick fled partway through his research, but how about their families? Bourgeois moved into a poor area of New York to do his research and took his wife and infant son with him. The second issue is consent. This issue of consent is especially problematic for sociological researchers because if people know they are being studied, they change their behaviour. School students who have experienced Ofsted inspections will understand exactly what I mean. Hence, informed consent is impossible in many situations. Also, having studied a group without their consent, is it ethical to publish your research without their consent? The third issue, deception, is related to informed consent. Sociologists doing covert research are deceiving the subjects of their research. However, the research would be impossible without this deception. Hobbes was faced with this situation in his research on East End criminals and the CID. He covertly befriended a number of officers to find out what they were doing and thus deceived his former colleagues and effectively condoned their illegal behaviour. The fourth issue is privacy and confidentiality of data. The privacy of the people studied should be preserved and nothing published should make them identifiable. Hence, the names of towns and schools are hidden in pseudonyms, such as Downtown and J. Lee, and respondents given names such as Bill and Ben. There are further ethical issues. Organisations which fund research may want to restrict the publication of the results, or may want a particular finding, and researchers can be pressured to alter their results. The British Sociological Association advises that sociologists should have a contract at the outset to avoid such a situation. Any sociologist researching into illegal activity in a deviant group may be faced with taking part in deviant behaviour, thus being potentially subject to arrest. Not taking part would threaten their place in the group, so difficult choices have to be made. Furthermore, it would seem obvious that it is immoral to experiment on human beings without their informed consent. 
although it does appear that an American twin study separated twins at birth in the 1960s. So ethical issues are diverse and complex, with total adherence to the Code of Ethics very little research into deviant behaviour would be possible. The potential negative impact of any research on any groups of the population may be unavoidable, if sociological knowledge is to grow and social problems are to be understood. What can we conclude from our discussion? The issues surrounding the choice of sociological research methods are many and varied. Their division into theoretical, practical and ethical allows us to separate the analysis of each part in turn. However, the issues may actually be inseparable. It may be practical to study armed robbers in prison, as Roger Matthews did, but he could only study those who had actually been caught. Those who had escaped capture might have quite different characteristics. Laurie Taylor's study of the London underworld used a snowball sample and may have been equally unrepresentative. Overall then, theoretical, practical and ethical issues in the research process must all be considered and whether one set of issues is paramount depends inevitably on the circumstances of the study.